You're listening to Bachu Talk, a podcast for government and professional services professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram, and I will be sitting down with our government leaders, outsourced business service leaders, government entrepreneurs, voluntary community social enterprise leaders, independent policy think tank leaders to share their stories, discuss their career, and learn all about their values and collective impact in our society. Today's guest is Matt Hyde OBE. Matt is chief exec of the Scouts. the UK's largest co-educational youth movement formerly the chief executive of national union of students he has undertaken a number of leadership roles in the charity sector and has chief executive of and has been chief executive of scouts contributed to a period of record membership growth since he joined in 2013 he has overseen the development and delivery of rebrand award winning campaigns and spearheaded work to support the growth of scouting in areas of deprivation matt is also trustee of comic relief a patron of unlock and was previously vice chair of national council for voluntary organizations he developed the world's first degree apprenticeship for social change which launched at queen mary university of london in 2019 matt was awarded an obe in 2020 new year's honors lit and an honorary fellowship from the queen mary university of london in 2012 wow matt was named as one of the 25 most influential charity sector leaders by charity times in 2019 matt welcome to scribble talk great to have you with us very good to be here basco <laughs> matt there is so much to talk about but before we begin let's talk about you where were you born let's talk about your high school and education okay i was born in peterborough in the fens in uh, the east of england uh in a small uh i grew up in a small town called ramsey uh which had about 7 or 8000 people and my uh i grew up above a family business actually we lived above the family business that sold uh, furniture and drapery and and uh it was started in 1876 and it and it shut down in 2005 and um Yeah then I went to school uh there in in Ramsey um so quite a quiet market town um not a massive amount going on and uh yeah that's that's how it all started any early memories of being in school and uh, uh childhood around the area Ramsey Peterborough well i i mean lots of memories about the shop in particular because mm. i mean really it was a uh, it was a it was an old uh style shop like it was proper victorian front and every saturday morning as a teenager if i was trying to have a lie in the front doorbell would go uh which was like a like a bell you know one of those old fashioned shop bells that open when you open the door and that would wake me up at about half past 8 when the shop was open on a saturday but the sh- it was run really i would say like a sort of social enterprise or a not for profit organization not not just because it didn't make much profit but because um but because actually its whole focus was doing things for the local community and that was really how i was brought up mum and dad were always doing things uh for the residents of ramsey whether that be um I don't know involved in the rotary club or the chamber of trade or the women's institute or running local fates and and my dad I mean they're still alive um thank goodness in their in their early 80s and they're still as much the sort of life and soul of that um town and community as they were when I was growing up so loads of happy memories of um always being involved in um or observing my my family doing things that made a difference to that small town. Mm. Amazing math, amazing. So <clears throat> after schools, higher education and what was your first job? After well, my very first job actually was in Ramsey, which the the two first jobs were um doing a paper round and uh and one day I was uh I was paid to sweep hair at the local hairdresser and I was so bad at it I was basically fired after one day. So um uh that was that was a, a kind of when I was in school but when I went to university I got involved in the 
running of the local, the running of the, the university football team. Um, so sport was my kind of big thing. And then I didn't really know what I was going to do. And someone said I should run for student union president, mm. which was a sort of paid role, sabbatical role. And mm. I did that for two years, got elected, did that for two years at Queen Mary University of London absolutely loved it it was one some of the most fun i've had probably in my life and um and after that moved on to i got elected to be president of the university of london union which was all of the colleges in the university of london um from kings to imperial to lse uh obviously queen mary royal holloway uh, about 110,000 students at the time and that was great and i worked on it was a different role because it was more about representation on a, on a grander scale. And one of the big things I suppose I achieved while I was there was winning a campaign for uh, a discount um, for students to use on what is now transport for London. And that's still in place today. Uh, When it was first introduced, it was limited to, it was just for up to 25 year olds and then we won it for all students and it, and even now you can get your third off travel in um in uh, uh for transport for london on on the underground or on the um or on the the buses so yeah that was a really formative and and special time um it was only one year uh after that i was planning to get out of student unions and i got uh, approached about becoming a senior manager in a student union which was quite a jump actually even now I look back at it now it was um, uh, someone um, put a lot of faith in me and I, I um, went for that first senior management role and that was at King's College London Student Union as the uh, uh, I think it was called deputy chief exec uh, or deputy general manager at the time so there you go. That then led to a longer period and the sort of professional side of student unions. And student unions are incredible organisations. They really are. I mean, they do everything from, um, I mean, people will know them for, I don't know, either nightclubs or um, <laughs> pr- protesting and representation. But actually, they provide welfare advice, academic representation. They stop people getting kicked off their courses. Um, they provide a range of commercial services, uh, retail, um, catering, um, yes, obviously entertainment as well. And, and are just such, when, they, when they're run well, makes such a difference um, to university life. Obviously, all the clubs and societies, which that getting people involved in that sense of associational life, I think is so formative. And indeed, many people then go on to um, be captains of industry or or uh uh often politicians so uh many people who i work with are now um uh politicians what 10 15 20 years on my god mac you made it sound so simple <laughs> behind it i know how how it is to manage you know, the, uh, the students on one hand and the university's expectations on the other end and you becoming the interface between the those. Any interesting memories from your time on working in the students' union? Any interesting? Oh, of- I mean, so, so many. I mean, I used to run a, I, I, I did, you could do every, you, it was the breadth of what you could do. So mm. one day I remember we were, uh, well, we campaigned and got, um, uh, a few million pounds from the university to do up the um, un- the student union building. Another time we were uh, used to be engaging with politicians or I remember the comedian Lee Hurst wanted to um, set up a, a comedy club in the East End and doing media with him to say this is what students want. Uh, then actually the other thing I used to do was host a kind of uh, Wednesday night entertainment I suppose you could loosely call it a show for all the sports teams and that was amazing because that kind of grew to having you know the 100 people to hundreds and hundreds of people coming every Wednesday so you could it was a perfect canvas to kind of think about what are the things that I enjoy doing and that can add value and 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 it really developed lots of my skills during that period even even the 
Wednesday night um, uh, sort of entertainment shows we used to do was one of the first times I was standing in front of an audience and either occasionally making them laugh or being like, developing the confidence to not be phased by that when you then, you know, years later are going and addressing however many hundred or thousand um, uh, volunteers within the scout movement. They're, 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 these are really kind of formative experiences that set the foundations for the, the rest of your career, really. Got it. So from that journey, uh, let's gradually move into your current role. Uh, what happened from King's College and all the way to the Scouts? Okay, so I went to, um, after about a couple of years, I went to, I got approached to go to Goldsmiths College Student Union. And that was my first chief exec role. So that was, it was as it was called general manager, but that was, uh, I was 26. So this is my 20th year, I realized recently, of being a chief exec. <laughs> uh, and Goldsmiths is an amazing place, great college in the uh, in Deptford, New Cross. It's, uh, you know, in one of the most deprived parts of the country, but just has is so grounded and edgy and cool and fun and creative. It's an incredible college that for, it's, it's an arts college. And we ran the student union, which was uh, every bit of uh, uh, the center of, of that college life. And it's where uh, bands like Blur came from and um, other sort of very, very famous artists as well. So I did that for five years. That was a lot of fun. That really taught me the nuts and bolts of leadership and, 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 some of the practical stuff about understanding, I don't know, about financial management. So if you, you know, when you're raising invoices or completing purchase orders, what happens in terms of how that links to the management accounts and what does that mean in terms of the orders to accounts at the end of the year and how does it all fit together? So that was a really good uh, grounding. And at the same time, I did an MBA as well. And that's one of the reasons why I went to Goldsmiths. I've done it. I'd done a diploma in management studies. I, I did that MBA um, at University of Westminster. After that, I um, started to look for different roles. I, I um, there was one or two I went for and didn't get. And if I'm honest, I thought I'd got myself in a bit of a career cul-de-sac and should I have got out of student unions earlier mm. um, as I sort of approached my thirties. I then I joined what was NUS had a trading company called NUS Services Limited still does at the time it was probably not far off around then or it's in its peak it had it was a purchasing consortium of turning over about 120 million pounds mainly um, uh, the licensed trade <laughs> a lot of booze being drunk in those days a lot less now um, and um and also uh, retail support and catering support as well. And I and I, I got onto the board of that, elected onto the board, um, which was really good. I did a lot of work with them, uh, started to do work with them on the ethical and environmental side of purchasing, which involved constructive engagement with the likes of Coca-Cola and um, other uh, companies, um, Nestle, where there were ethical concerns and change some of those practices. We grew that area when I was a, a director responsible for the ethical and environmental side um, to be about how you greened the supply chain and, and promoted ethical practice. Um, I did that for about a year and a half. And then um, the, I was then again approached by the then president of uh, NUS to the National Unitunes to consider a role that they had created at uh, National Union of Students, which was a deputy, what was then called Deputy National Director, but it was Deputy Chief Exec role. And I went for that, uh, got it. Uh, within three months, my boss had resigned and I was within four or five months, the the 
interim chief exec and then subsequently became the chief executive of the National Union of Students. And it wasn't a straightforward organisation, shall we say. <laughs> it had had 10 years worth of deficits. I think when I went in, it had 20% of the staff had a grievance out. Mm. It was not a healthy or happy culture. Mm. No real strategy. Um, its members, and it had dual membership, students were members, but um, actually the real members, the people who paid the bills were student unions. Mm. And the stock of NUS was very, very low. It was very poor reputation. And over the next six years we did a lot of good we saved students about two billion pounds we um uh won a lot of campaigns we transformed the organization um we consolidated a lot of the work we did some pretty groundbreaking strategies that we um delivered and our the reputation of the organization um went from uh about I think it was about 37% satisfaction to, to work to nearly up in the eighties when up by the time I left. So it was a great time and it was a, it was a bigger and more complex operation, highly political. It was all around the time of um, uh, tuition fees in um, 2010 as well, dealing with government ministers, dealing with them, um, uh, secretaries of state, special advisors, uh, and, and then, then also running the kind of, the 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 retail the um purchasing consortium as well and then um i was just thinking about leaving and uh one of my mentors stuart etherington who was the chief exec of the uh, national uh, council of voluntary organizations at the time said scouts have you thought about the scouts were you a scout <laughs> and i said uh uh, yes, I was, but I haven't really thought about the Scouts for 20 plus years. And he said that their chief exec was leaving. And I went through the process there and it felt such an amazing fit because it had, it really brought together what I talked to you about, Vasco, in terms of those, that family upbringing and the importance mm. of community and volunteering mm. Mm. it also brought together scouts has a big commercial side just as student the student movement has um it was uk wide i'd had experience of doing uk all the complexities of running uh, a, a movement or an organization across the um devolved nations um membership based voluntary based um everything that leads to in terms of com complex governance and I've been there for uh, eight years this month, or just a month just gone. And it's been a blast. And um, it's the most incredible movement. Pre-pandemic, we had 460,000 young people. Um, we'd added on, uh, and, and 160,000 adult volunteers, 70,000 young people on the waiting list. And we grew membership between 2006 and 2020 from uh but by, by sorry by 200,000 members so it's been an incredible period of growth growth in uh in, it's, it's where we've grown that's been a, as important to me as the fact we've grown so we opened scout units cub packs um scout troops in uh, 1260 areas of deprivation mm. um so it's yeah it's an incredible movement and we're part of a worldwide family of uh, 53 million scouts across the world wow. matt not many listeners know the scouts um you know if you can give a overview of the scouts and also specifically any uh, campaigns that's close to your heart that would be really helpful. And also in this COVID crisis, when everyone was locked down, I know Scouts, they do a lot of outdoor activities. Mm. Um, now, how was it for you to run Scouts within this lockdown period? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, let's say for those who don't know, Scouts is um, uh, a education, non non-formal education program for six to twenty-four year olds here in the UK. It's slightly different across the world. 
run by adult volunteers and through that we help young people have fun friendship adventure and through that they learn skills for life and that's what we keep talking about a lot when we talk about the benefits of scouting it's the skills for life that you learn by being outdoors through play um through games semi-structured learning um in a non-formal learning environment so out of the classroom and the lecture theater that is fundamental to your life chances and your well-being and um you know I can talk more about that if it's helpful, but that's what we do. And it goes into different sections, we call them. So Beaver Scouts is six to eight, Cub Scouts, eight to ten and a half, Scouts, ten and a half to 14, Explorer Scouts, 14 to 18. And then we have a provision called Network, which is 18 to 24. And that's when people tend to tr transition into becoming um, Scout leaders. We've been around for 113 years, 114 years now and uh, established by Baden Powell who ran an experimental camp um, we are then for boys today we are boys and girls all genders um, but when, when we were established it was about getting young people outdoors it was 20 boys who went to the original Brown Sea Island experimental camp and from a mix of those from the best public schools and some of the poorest backgrounds to make them work together to make them realize they had more in common than divided them and a lot of those same things are true today now what happened in the pandemic was in march 2020 was we couldn't meet face to face for the first time in that history of over 100 and yeah 13 14 years and that's significant because we even met face to face in the two world wars so to give you a scale of what we were facing it was truly historic and as you say 50 percent of our program is outdoors and we encourage young people to um, the benefits of outdoors whether that's camping or campfires and yes we've modernized the program so you can do digital making badge and social action and, and community impact but actually you know that thing about being outdoors is still very important to our what we would describe as our theory of change so within a week we had um uh, developed a program called the great indoors which was 200 activities online um it was downloaded by 500,000 families both scouts and non-scouts and i think was a a real um lifesaver for lots of and particularly parents and carers who were looking to do activities for their young people. We then um, got a fantastic um, partnership with Zoom, who kindly uh, allowed us to have free licenses. And that meant that 80% um, of our groups continued to meet online through the lockdowns. Um, and that's been incredible, really. And, and just the sheer tenacity and ingenuity of our, our adult volunteers I mean I couldn't be more proud of them and what they achieved because they're very special people who just kept the show on the road and um, we also did things like the biggest ever digital camp we've run so 120,000 young people took part in the what, the great indoors weekender which was a, a where young people could camp even in the either in the homes or out in the gardens at home we raised uh, with the match funding 750,000 pounds for the Big Night Inn for Comic Relief and Children in Need back in April last year. And when we found that 500 um, scout groups were at risk of closure because of a lack of funding, we uh, raised a further 700,000 uh, for uh, them and uh, ended up actually with additional funding we got from uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and the Pairs Foundation, that meant that we were able to fund 854 scout groups to stop them from being closed. So that was our response. And um, I mean, just the sheer scale of what we do meant that on Zoom, it was, uh, there, were, there were a lot of online meetings. There were 225 million minutes of online meetings featuring 4 million participants 
and 459,000 meetings. So that's that's a lot of reach. And um, fortunately, we are now in a position where we can again meet face to face, although at the moment we can't camp. Um, we're hoping that from the 21st of June, we'll be able to do that. But young people, we lost a lot of young people in the last year. I'll, I'll be honest about that because obviously um, people just weren't able to or didn't want to meet um, on, on online. Um, uh, but they're coming back in droves. And uh, I think that our recovery, hopefully like the economy, is going to be a V-shaped recovery. Mike. <clears throat> My God, Matt, you know, the way you need to uh, shift your entire <laughs> entire association during this COVID times and also keep, I have two kids, right? And I can't even keep them at home. <laughs> you know, it's tough. And uh, you know, my wife pretty much was like, I am walking away. You know, and uh, the schools, the schools was it open? The, the laptop was taken over. It could have been pretty challenging. Again, you made it sound simple, Matt. <laughs> so any positive or any shout outs uh, from the team or anything that you, that you saw in this past one year that really moved you? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I'm... I remember going for a run and a, uh, someone running the other direction who stopped me and I wondered what on earth was uh, the matter. And he said, uh, you're the guy from the Scouts, aren't you? I said, yes. Mm. He said, um, I just want you to know that uh, when my son does scouting online, it's the only time of the week we hear him laugh. Oh, wow. And I just think there are moments like that that are so special. And it's not me; it's 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 the volunteers who've given their time to mm. to do that. Um, moments like that are so special and so simple, but actually really, really powerful. I mean, particularly when you think about children and young people's mental health and how that's been affected over the last year. But also, there's young people who've done incredible things themselves. There's people like um, Max Woozy, who was um, um, a young uh, scout who'd um, his friend died and sadly died of cancer and left him a tent and told him to have an adventure in it and Max camped out in his back garden for a full year and raised over 280,000 for the pounds for the hospice that had cared for him mm. and then there's another uh, cub scout called Arthur Stone who tragically lost his legs to meningitis but um, Arthur still went on to cover 20, 20 kilometres of uh, around his local park in a, in a wheelchair and raised more than ten thousand pounds for the disability uh, charity Limb Power Juniors, so they're the kind of they're the inspiration. They're the, they're these are the stories that have shown at whatever age you are, whatever we've been up against, incredible acts of kindness and generosity, and a sense that you can make a real difference and 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 the positive that can come out of what's been a truly awful situation for so many people totally matt totally my god i mean like uh, when you see that's the, those kids doing what they are doing when you see them i'm sure your energy comes across from those children <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can feel it that's brilliant uh, matt so matt talk us through about your team matt and now how how, how is scout structured i know it's built up of volunteers but i'm sure you have a team and in, in this in this time how we all work together? Yeah, we we've got um so as the the hundred and forty thousand volunteers is run on a hierarchical system, and it's been that way since the sort of day one. So we have um uh at the at the grassroots level groups, group scout leaders, and then the cub scout leader would report into them, or the or the scout leader or the beaver scout leader reports into the group scout leader. They they report into a district who report into a county who report into um, uh, a, a nation's uh, m meeting. So uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, England, it comes in directly, or there's regional commissioners. Um, all of those groups, districts and counties are all separate charities. So there's 8,000 separate charities as part of our federation. And that then reports into a uh, top team, Team UK, led by a UK chief commissioner, whose name is Tim Kidd. And then he reports into the board and then I lead the staff side, work with him, lead the staff side to provide the support and services to the volunteer movement. Uh, we have now just under 300 staff. We had about 400 staff before the pandemic, but 
sadly last year like so many people we had to um downsize and we've had to sell assets as well um to see us through the um uh, through through the 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 impacts of the pandemic and particularly from our point of view the loss of commercial income that we we rely on to provide our services to volunteers and um yeah that's um so so i have a top team of five uh that lead a brilliant top team and they lead those um 300 staff to provide those those services and that's there are different directorates there there's a commercial directorate there's a support services directorate there's a frontline delivery um of um uh, scouting uh, support for scouting which my chief operating officer and deputy leads and then there's a comms directorate as well wow Matt, one of the reasons you have vacancies is maybe there is a lack of adult volunteers. Are you running any campaigns or anything to fill the gap, Matt? Yes, we are. Actually, on the uh, 27th of May, we're going to be talking about this a lot more. We're going to be talking about the fact that we lost a lot of young people uh, out of membership over the last year, having grown so much the previous 14 years but that um, those young people are now coming back in droves. We've lost adult volunteers also, and we need more adult volunteers. We needed more adult volunteers before the pandemic, let alone now. And uh, even though before the pandemic, we were at our highest ever number of adult volunteers. So we're going to be talking uh, about that, as I say, at the end of May. And we're going to be talking about the fact that, you know, the reason to get involved with um, volunteering with Scouts is because, Clearly, it's good for the community and clearly it ultimately is good for young people. And, and that will be a driver for lots of people. But we're also going to be saying that volunteering is good for you as well. It's good for your um, skills. It's good for your well-being and it's good to be connected as part of something. So we know that, you know, four out of 10 people in the country said they were lonely last year and volunteering is an incredible way of of being part of something bigger and meaningful and uh, about 70 percent of our volunteers um tell us that uh, it helps um volunteering helps both with their well-being but also being um connected and and having a sense of belonging so if you're in if you're listening to this and you're interested and, and you do want to get involved or you want to support us in any way whatsoever within the scouts if you go to scouts.org.uk you can either go there and sign you sign your kids up to be um, members or you can um, sign up as a volunteer or express an interest as a volunteer and of course you can donate there as well but the real push at the moment is we need those volunteers because young people have been so badly affected by the pandemic they've lost out on a year of their lives which is a major part of their lives Mm. they'll never get that year back they have um, been cooped up at home some of them have been trying to cope without the right um, uh, it equipment or um, and and have been uh, have been uh, in particular circumstances where it it, the the the, um, uh, pandemic has had such a massive impact on them and here's an opportunity to help those young people to um, regroup learn those skills for life spend time with friends and yet at the same time as a volunteer you will be learning so much and you will be benefiting because volunteering is good for you wow definitely man i think part of this podcast we will add the relevant registration links and if you have any campaign messages or campaign links matt we'll add to it so, you know, listeners, please do, please do come on board. I know we all have been locked down and, uh, um, you know, mentally we all have been sharing at the screen for a very long time. Hope this gives us an opportunity to go out to the nature, do what we need to do. Thank you, Matt, 100%. You know, our support will be with you and continue to inspire, Matt. Yes, Matt, I think, you know, we all went, I think business-wise, it's um it's it's been um it's been pretty tough as mm. well and mm. uh, at the same time when you're passionate when you know that you can bring this changes in the society it's quite frustrating as well you know like you want to make an impact but you need to work around uh, the numbers to make it happen that's, that's right uh, that's uh, 
That's beautiful, Sam. Thank you for that. Sam, uh, uh, Matt, from then, um, you know, you were not there. You also are trustee to Comic Relief and there are so many other things that you've also been part of, Matt. Uh, also talk us through about other things. I hope you sleep every day but then. But, uh... <laughs> well, I'm a scout volunteer as well. That's the other thing. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, on a Wednesday night, I'm, uh, I'm the scout leader for my local, my son's local troop as well, good. which has been good fun. I mean, that's kept me, that keeps me grounded and mm. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. on the ground. Uh, no, look, Comic Relief is an incredible charity and does has done has raised so much money um over the years um and and for so many great causes he's got some brilliant people involved like you know the incredible richard curtis of um the creator of black adder and mr bean and uh of vicar dibley and, and all, all manner of other things and um it, it that also uh, played its part in the pandemic because with with children in need it it, it um ran the big night in to raise millions of pounds for communities that have been affected by the pandemic and then also had run a sport relief last year and this year has run another um uh, run another red nose day so it's a very dynamic organization that is having to change with uh wider society particularly in terms of the sort of channel shift away from everyone sitting around a tv um uh, the sort of T- traditional telethon appeal um is having to adapt as um as as trends have adapted and channels have shift you know the uh, viewers and channels trends have shifted in the world of media away from you know uh, for the four channels that were there when i was growing up to now netflix or youtube or um people consuming media in completely different ways so that it were it were at a very interesting time. We've just um, appointed a brilliant new chief executive, um, Samir Patel. I think he's going to be great. And um, yeah, it's interesting times for for all charities, but but particularly Comet Relief. Yes, Sam. Uh, yes, Matt. I just want to uh, talk specifically about the charity sector, Matt. How was it? What's different in the charity sector, Matt? And what do you think? Anybody who is coming to charity sector from the industry or from the government or from any of the sectors, what do you think they should know? Well, I mean, in, in many ways, what strikes me, whether I've been involved in Ensley Insurance or other sort of commercial um, encounters, whether that's with corporate partnerships or what have you, mm. I'm struck by the similarity with leadership challenges. So, you know, everyone's thinking to be thinking at the moment about um, returning to work. What does the world, what does the workplace look like? Hybrid working. They're going to be thinking about the mental health and well-being of their um, organizations. They're going to be thinking about the sustainability of their business models. And they're going to be thinking about how they um, adapt their strategy at a time of great uncertainty and change. Anyone worth their salt is going to be investing in digital transformation um, we're going to be thinking about wider issues about sustainability more broadly. So, you know, these, these are, um, you know, I think you think when you're in a particular sector, you think lots of your um, challenges and opportunities are unique and some of them will be, but the vast majority are, are pretty standardized leadership challenges. Uh, I think what is different with a, um, uh, charity is the bottom line is not always the bottom line so what you're measured on is not always growth or profit whilst sustainability is important from a financial point of view it's about the impact you are making as an, as an organization uh, on your beneficiary group or whatever you want, want to call them and that's that's really what you're there to do so you're not there to amass capital you're not there to um, uh, reward shareholders you're there to ensure that you are using your resources that you will have earned and will need to continue to earn to, to best best effect um, what is so special about that therefore is that sense of um satisfaction from knowing that you're making a difference to people's lives and um uh, 
with many of the same components that you would have got in a um, in another industry. And um, I think when I talk to people who move from government into the charity sector, I think there's a degree of freedom that you get in the world of charities that you can shape your own destiny and you're not net, you're not beholden to political masters that can change but you, you of course are still accountable to a wider set of stakeholders and uh, obviously your board so so some things are you know ultimately you're always accountable to someone um but i think that's what a lot of people enjoy about the um the, the charity world is that they're you know they're they're they are their own enterprises and and they have to find their own way in the world very well said matt very well said matt we talked about your early life career a lot about the scouts and also about charity sector now let's talk more about you matt tell us three things not many people know about you uh, well, I've given you what well, I don't know whether the people know these or not. It depends who's listening, but I've already told you I'm a scout volunteer. So that's probably a, <laughs> yeah, a good one to do. Um, uh, I suppose linked to the comic relief connection. I'll give you two comedy ones that people won't, some people will know, people who know <laughs> me. But uh, when I was 14, I wrote to John Cleese to ask Ooh. him if he had a fan club. And he wrote back to say, all of his fan club were murdered by Michael Palin's fan club in 1983. <laughs> uh, I've put that on social media a few years ago and I, that's, that's the most I've ever had any retweets in my life. Um, and when I was at, when I was president of ULO, I did get interviewed by Ali G, mm. but I never signed the release papers. So you'll never see it, Basco. Oh no. It would be too <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> There's another one. There's three. <laughs> Looks like there is an alternative version of you, Matt, which we yeah. might need to explore there. <laughs> but that's good. Matt, what are your hobbies and interests, Matt, outside work? Well, I like watching sport. I particularly mm. like football and cricket. I'm a Peterborough United fan uh, mm. and. Uh, Oh, called the posh and the posh have just got promoted into the championship so it's been a i have to be honest with you that's been one of the things that's kept me going watching them on this thing called i follow each week has been one of the things that kept me going in lockdown uh, it probably wouldn't have been quite so much fun if they were losing every week but the fact they were doing so well was just enormous enormous fun really really um, and we we went up in the most dramatic fashion as well. So I love I love watching my cricket, and uh, you know, one of the things I missed really missed in the last year is not being able to go with my dad because that's one of my highlights of the year. Um, we love travel as a family. We love food. We love our art, and we love our cinema. And all I mean, many of these things have got. I love, you know, I love going to restaurants. I love going to yeah, I, <laughs> I, many of these things. Of course, we've not been able to do for so long. I'm yes. really, really looking forward to Monday yeah. um, next week because just I mean, the next week my plan. I've, I'm meeting some old friends for a, a meal out inside, not in the freezing cold on Thursday. <laughs> And then uh, going to a museum with my son the following Saturday. And and it's really interesting, isn't it? How much the, we took these things for granted and when they've been taken away from us, um, it really, life has felt very flat without those things that give us meaning and, and joy, actually. So there you go. That's, that, that's, they're, they're my kind of, that's, that's what keeps me happy. I totally, totally, man. I think you nailed it there. Nailed it. I think simple things that we, as you rightly said, which we always took it for granted now when it, when it was taken away from us, like you need mm. to wear a mask, you need to wear this. I'm like, I can't breathe. And I, you know, before I used to be open, but now, now we need to wear a mask. And then all these, uh, it's all good for our own sanity, but, you know, accepting the new way of life or the new normal, as they call it, was challenging. Yeah. But here we are, as you rightly said, few more days we all will be out at least for a few months before yes. they say 
wave three is coming up. <laughs> That's right. Well, particularly the mask wearing is particularly challenging for us fellow uh, glass wearers. Yes. Uh, because, you know, I've, I've just about got the hang of trying not to get too steamed up when I was for the, <laughs> it took me quite a while <laughs> to work out how to do that. Perfect. Yes, Matt. We are quickly enter what we call the random rapid fire questions, man. There's no right or wrong answer. Whatever okay. comes in your mind, that's it. So if you were a professional wrestler, what would your ring name be and why? <laughs> um, uh, oh, my goodness me. Um, a prof- I don't really know. What did they used to have? They- I mean, it, what there was a Hulk Hogan, wasn't there? Yeah. Um, so what? I'd probably be Hyde Hogan. Does that work? <laughs> Does that work? Perfect. So, if you could be invisible for a day, what would you do? That's always such a strange question, isn't it? Because I always mm. think it's slightly voyeuristic, and um, so I always think it sounds <laughs> a bit seedy. But I would probably. What I would be really interested in is I'd be interested to go to number 10 Mm. and see what discussions really take place uh, behind the closed doors when, um, you know, particularly over the last year. Correct. What what is what's Chris Whitty really saying to Boris Johnson and uh, <laughs> Patrick Valance? And I just think it'd be for that would be fascinating. So that's probably what I'd do. Hundred percent, hundred percent, man. Do you have any nicknames? Um, my friends often call me. My very close friends call me Hido, uh, which was a uh, uh, it was a. I think it goes back to when as all us cricket fans were with the Australians who would. Uh, they would all all seem to give each other. Shane Warne would seem to give everyone uh, an, a, a name that ended in O. So that's where yeah. it comes from. A nice, nice. That's uh, perfect. What was your best subject in school? Uh, either English or history. And I went on to study English for my first degree. And mm. sometimes wish I'd done history because I. But but I don't know. I I mean I love I love the arts generally. Um, my real passion, I think, if I'm really honest with myself, is history and politics. So if I, you know, even now, if I tend to choose, if it's not a leadership book, if it's not a novel, it's either a leadership book or a book on um, on politics. I'm just coming towards the end of Obama's um, autobiography at the moment. Um, Matt, if you have a time machine, what would you do with it? Um, well, I'm not sure I'd go forward. I think I'd go back. Mm. So the question is, when would I go back to? Mm. I mean, I want, you know, that's probably, probably a glib answer is something like, I'd love to have seen some of those gigs the Beatles did. Um, <laughs> but actually more profoundly, I'd probably want to go back to something like the crucifixion or something like that, but oh. to, uh, about, you know, and to really sort of, see that whole pair of my own eyes but there you are that's probably too serious so let's let's go with the Beatles one <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice but what's something that you have is of sentimental value um my wedding ring mm. had to get that one right didn't I not that not that my wife will ever listen to this but <laughs> you never know good you never, never know, know. Show sure, someone she knows will listen and exactly. she said you oh you scored a brownie point there man you did well yeah. there that's a proper <laughs> proper six in the cricket <laughs> Wait, so um, if you could make a rule for a day and everyone had to follow it what would it be make a rule mm-hmm. um i uh, uh what would i want them to do uh i would uh, oh I, it would be something about being kind to each other and everyone had to be kind that's such a clear that's such a sort of um simplistic answer isn't it but um but that's the, the question is would everyone follow it but if everyone followed it would it would be in a better place wouldn't we i would say you know you just look about how what would you build on from the last year and it would it would be acts of kindness wouldn't it 
Hundred percent, man. That's the whole reason this podcast is all about that little act of kindness. You nailed it there. What's in your bucket list, man? Oh, lots of travel, and I feel like that even more over the last year. I um, mm. I want to go to Australia. I want to go to. I've never done safari. Um, there's bits of South America I'd like to go to. Um, so that's on my bucket list. Um. I would like to, there's certain sporting events or grounds I'd like to go to around the world. I would, um, we talk, we always talk about being, moving towards somewhere near the sea. Now, whether or not I'll ever do that, I don't know. Um, that's a bit of a, maybe a pipe dream. Um, but do you know what? That's I'm fairly contented. There's different, you know, there's different restaurants I'd like to go to. There's, you know, things like that. <laughs> but I don't, I don't really have an. I mean, it's, the bucket list is more about travel, I would say, than travel. anything else. Perfect. I think 100. percent You're right. Especially now, everybody needs to get out because yeah. I I turned 40 this year and I had massive plans for 40 travel this country. Right. Meet my friends there. And I ended up walking from my office, which is 20 minutes all the way to my home. But that's the whole year gone. And exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, we should have been going to Florida this year. And instead, we're going to Margate. So um, that's not quite the same. But we've moved Florida to next year. God, yeah, definitely. Yeah, brilliant. Who haven't you seen or talked to in a long time and you hope that they're doing okay? Um... Oh, that's interesting. Well, my friend Tom, I've not spoken to him in a while. I'd like mm. to speak to him again soon and meet up with him soon. Mm. I've been pretty good at, other than that, keeping in touch with um, my, I mean, family members. We've been pretty regularly in touch throughout uh, lockdown. Um, and there's always these people that, you know, you come across in your career that you really get on with and then don't. Um, and then you lose touch with or you, you you never really find the time to see them again. And I was just thinking there were some people, particularly from NUS, mm. um, who I would like to catch up with. I've actually I have to say, Basco, I've had a bit of a it's been a bit of a sad day for me or dif- difficult start to the day because one of my oh. friends is the um, MP Wes Streeting, who I work with at um uh, when I was at NU, when I, he was NUS president, when I was when I was chief executive, and he's now the MP for Ilford North and um, mm. uh, shadow member of the cabinet, and he's just announced today that he's got um, kidney cancer. So oh, um, he um, uh, and we wish him all the best uh, over the next couple of weeks um, because he's um, going in for a, a operation. It's the mm. prognosis is good, and they've caught it early, which is good, but. Um, it it's just moments like that that really do make you remind you of how important your friends are and to make the most of them when you see them as well and um to wish them well so i'm sure he will be absolutely fine but um it's just a it's a good reminder isn't it about the importance of friends 100 percent, Matt. 100 percent. as you nailed it you know from from all our listeners and from me you know all the prayers to a good friend there i'm sure he'll come out strong man oh thank uh, you for that Thank you, Matt. Thank you. So, Matt, if you have been asked to make a special dinner for a very special guest, who will you invite and what will you cook? Well, um, I would, I, I would certainly, I would almost certainly cook something from Ottolenghi because that's one of my, he's one of my favourite uh, chefs and uh, writers. Um, I would probably want to cook for someone like I probably would want Barack Obama. I mean, I'm um, my I'm you you know our, our chief scout is um, Bear Grylls, who I was just talking to earlier today, and um, uh, he uh, he of course has spent time with the Obamas and just says what amazing people they are, they are. Um, so basically Barack and Michelle I'd like please and that sounds like a good good fun night (laughs) definitely I think I have to say um, at least four out of ten times the answer for this question is the other one is that right is that that's really interesting it is Uh, and uh, regardless whether it's black white or voluntary industry you name it government for some reason I think especially over dinner the wide variety of topics that you can talk and uh, 
that human thing. I think for some reason, you know, atheists, Obamas, and you know, at some point if they listen, I, they will know Matt's, <laughs> Matt's waiting. I am. And, uh... <laughs> I am. They can come over. Bear can come as well. Uh, and uh, and Shara. And yeah, that would be good. That's it. That's it. That's brilliant. Right? That's brilliant. So, uh, what's the biggest lesson life has taught you so far? I think being honest and open with yourself and others. Mm. If you speak truth in any, whether that's truth to power, mm. truth to yourself and your loved ones, mm. truth to your workforce and the people who work with you, mm. and you're honest, you don't have to remember what you should be saying. <laughs> and you can mm. be much more comfortable in your own skin. Wow. Very profound, Matt. Very profound. Thank you. Matt, who's the kindest person you know? Well, it probably might be someone like Bear, actually. Although mm. I have to say, my son is developing into a very generous young man as well. So he's mm. only 13, but I see mm. how he is with his friends and others. And um, mm. it's a, um, yeah, and we're very proud of him, uh, even at that young age. So, um, yeah, I'll go with them. Got it. So if I asked your son for a reference, what do you think he would say about that? A reference uh-huh. <laughs> about me. Uh-huh. Uh, what would he say? I think he'd say I'm fun. I think he'd say, uh, you know, you're not. As a, it's always when when parents talk about being friends with their children. Um, I think uh, you know we do get we get on and we have we have good times together. So yeah, I don't know. I think it's probably some fun. Perfect. And there's a thing. There's a quote in um, Danny Champion of the World with Roald Dahl. Um, he says you shouldn't let your parents. Your parents should be sparky, not stodgy. So hopefully, I'm sparky enough. <laughs> Definitely, Matt, you are, you are, 100%, I think, uh, yes. Who are the people who are the most influential in your life and career? Uh, probably family, in the broadest sense, parents, my wife, my sister. Um, I think they're the ones I always go to, and then friends after that. Um, and then there are some key people who have supported me along the way. And that's, that's changed over the years. I've worked with some incredible chief executives, um, who have, and continue to support and inspire me. Um, and, um, yeah, so, so I've been blessed to work with some quite incredible people. Definitely, Matt, definitely. Matt, what one advice would you give people who are looking to have a career like yourself? I, I would say follow the issues you're passionate about, because mm. if you're passionate about those issues, that will shine through. And anyone you, you're then working with will, um, you, you'll rise up the system because you're, you're, you'll give the time and commitment that it need that these roles need and to get to these roles that you need to do and passion is infectious and i think you know once you then do that make sure that you're creating other leaders along the way great leaders create other great leaders looking back at your life or career matt is there anything that um, you would look back now oh if i know that earlier maybe i could have done this differently no i don't think you should look like that I mean, you just did what you did in the best way at the time. I think if you if you go back, I mean, you can always say, you know, could I have, should I have gone out of student unions earlier or should I have um, should I have done something, you know, should I have got out of the charity sector earlier or things like that and done something different? Well, you know, I didn't, and and that's fine. And and it's and so far today, it's been a it's been a fantastic career, and I've been blessed to work with some incredible people. Like to think we've done a lot of good along the way or made or in the words of baden powell made the world a little better than we found it yes and um yeah you, i don't really i'm not really one for believing in regrets mm. it's wasted energy well said matt well said 
Can I talk about your OBE? How was it? How was that experience? Well, moment? I haven't picked it up yet. I've got to be honest with you, Basket. I, what I will tell you is the incredible thing about it, mm. so this was in <laughs> the kind of my world kind of unraveled after I got it. I have to be honest with you. So because this was at the this was in the New Year's honors list for 2020. So um, I found out about it late 2019. And of course, it's a huge privilege and honor. What made it all the more special was that in the same list, my father got an MBE mm-hmm. for services to his community. So we were both due to pick up our OBE and MBE respectively in March 2020. Uh, the week that the lockdown was announced Mm. Uh, and actually I wouldn't have been able to go anyway because I had COVID symptoms and we still don't know whether I actually had COVID or not but um, my wife and I were were poorly so we wouldn't have been able to go anyway but anyway that's so here we are a year and a bit on a year and a half on and we've still not picked it up but to be honest with you and and it'll be great if when we do uh, we will want to go together um but to be honest with you the fact that we could celebrate that as a family that christmas was a a real highlight in my life um because it wasn't just about the recognition i'd got it was about what dad had achieved as well and that made it all and it would have been i would have felt a little bit uncomfortable in fact um i'd said to him the night mm. before on that Christmas day, because he kept it quiet from the whole family until Christmas day uh, and said to him, I, I then my only thing, dad, is I wish you'd have been recognized for all you've done for this, the uh, mm. town. And he said, well, you know, they don't recognize people like me, you know, not the little people who do all the work, blah, blah, blah. And of course he knew that he'd got his MBE. And then he told us at the lunchtime the next day. <laughs> so he had the last laugh. Ah, oh, that's nice. He's, he's a proud dad, I'm sure, Matt. Well, and, I'm very uh, proud of him as well. Yeah, 100%. That's a super blessed. So, Honorary Fellowship from Queen Mary University. That's way back in 2012, Matt. Yeah, wow, that was a while ago. ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, well, that was, I mean, that, what was special about that was that it was, I believe it was um, proposed by the Students' Union. And mm. so, by by which time, this was long after I'd left. Um <laughs> Um, and so that was, yeah, that was always nice to be able to be put forward by, um, by the student union, but obviously recognized by, um, by the, by a college and a university rather that I'm still very much connected to because of developing this, um, social change degree apprenticeship, which I, we launched a couple of years ago, which was, a is an apprenticeship scheme for all well for all ages for after school leavers mm. and it was focused the, the the curriculum is pretty unique because it's focused on social change and the difference you can make in the world whether that's through policy or management or campaigning or social action um it uh, you when you do it you get placed with a an employer so a charity and you do and you earn and learn so we say you earn learn and change the world so you get paid you do a full honors degree from a top university on a completely unique course and you don't pay any tuition fees because the tuition fee is offset against the apprenticeship levy so it's been uh, you know that is one of i'm so proud of, of pulling that off because that's one of the few things in my normally what I do is I surround myself by very good people and um and then just set the conditions and let them be brilliant but this is one of the few things in my life I've actually sort of conceived worked through got it delivered um albeit that it I, I along the way of course needed a lot of support and help from some really really smart people around me like Liam Burns is a, um, our chief program officer at Scouts and a, and a guy called Jamie Hilder at um, Queen Mary and the, and the team at Queen Mary who and the principal who or you know basically the vice chancellor who believed in it as a um, as, as a major um, 
win and 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 that course is still running and we're just about to get into a new intake and it was a bit wobbly in the pandemic because we weren't able to uh, do an intake last year but I'm, I'm told they've got the numbers for this year as well and then they're just you know then the question is how the demand is massive the demand was higher than um people who are applying for um oxbridge courses and um the thing I'm really proud of is that the intake was 80% from black Asian and minority ethnic uh, communities, mm. which, you know, I just, I've always kind of thought about the challenges we're facing as a society and particularly as a sector, I have to be honest with you in terms of how we diversify our workforce and, and we've got, it's how do we move beyond blogs and, and social media messages to actually what are the, practical things that are going to make a difference and um, in its own little way i hope this does make a make a little bit of a difference 100 percent, matt 100 percent, matt talk us through about the the conviction charity that you're part of as well that sounds very interesting yeah unlock unlock i'm a patron of Un- unlock so that's um i, I can't pretend that's um much more than a than a sort of a title albeit that i'm a champion of what they do uh, when I was at Goldsmiths, we established a prison visiting scheme, which uh, won lots of awards because it, uh, it in- involved students being placed as visitors, also befriending prisoners um, at, at Brixton and, and other prisons. And we would train them up and support them. And one of the people, one of the organizations that did the training was an organization called Unlock, um, which is the um, uh, uh, association for uh, people, charity for people with convictions. And I kind of got very um, uh, moved and involved with their work only because I don't know, it just kind of captured my imagination and understanding more about how people who have convictions, however low level, um, suffer discrimination for many years after that. So you could have a fair dodging offence and it and it sticks with you um, for many, many years. And in other situations, people who, who serve their time and want to come out and start a new life find it difficult to get insurance or other things because they don't have an address. Uh, and and therefore you, you the risk being that you go back into a spiral of, of recidivism so it's it's a charity that's really punched above its weight it's small um based in kent but is is multi-award winning and they've made such an impact to so many young so many people on a on a on a cause that's still quite stigmatized you know people don't really want to stand up for people who've been offenders and I I think sometimes speaking up for marginalized communities like that are so important. Wow very well said Matt very well said I think uh, we had uh, the chief exec of the HM prison service was here as a guest and then you know because uh, my early early career with Serco was in the prison service and then you know my 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 wedding cards my business cards even till date is all printed in the prisons um so you know the people you know i still have i I cannot get away from the memory like when i got married and went back home um most of the prisoners because every prison has their own industry yes little industry and then yes i had t-shirts i had mugs i had mouse pads i had so i mean i even even a wooden structure that was made by the prisoners just because you know i was there you know i mean like these people they don't know for whatever the reason they are there but when they come out um it's it's great that uh, you know this this charity is uh, what you talked about um yes yeah, so matt 25 most influential person in the charity times um that's that sounds very powerful man <laughs> well i mean these things are what they are i mean it's very nice uh it's not very nice to be included in when you're not it's not so you know you can say well actually why are I there they are what they are there's some people's uh perceptions and that's great i i think you're one you always got to be a bit wary of those sorts of things because i always believe you're only as good as the next thing you're going to do and Mm, um mm. that's um not to put undue pressure on yourself but it, it's that that just you know these 
recognitions and awards and they're they're all they're great and they're lovely and they're, and you can and you you can and i do believe you should take a moment to celebrate them and say yeah isn't that great isn't that nice to be recognized but then crack on with the next thing you're going to do to to make the world a bit better totally matt totally matt we talked a lot about your career with um, you know charity a little bit about you um is there any part of your life or career or charity work that you have done with that we haven't touched Matt or is there anything else you would like to say? I think you've been pretty comprehensive, Pascal. I think it's the, it's the most comprehensive interview I think I've probably ever done. So. <laughs> <laughs> so next time when somebody is asking you, if you are going for an interview, just tell them, listen, listen. To yeah, this. exactly. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And if there is anything not covered, then I will answer. So yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. Matt, thank you so much. It's been an absolute privilege to have you with us at Bachi Talk, Matt. You know, wish you, your colleagues, your family, everybody, the scout volunteers, all the good health and happiness. Please do continue to inspire everybody around you. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy. Well, thank you so much for inviting us on and for your <laughs> generous questioning as well. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Please do visit bachi.com forward slash bachi talk podcast to this specific episode link to everything that was mentioned in this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, review and share bachi talk podcast with your loved ones. We will see you at the next episode with another special guest. Until then, it's Baska Sundram from Bachi signing off.